Hey, Talking Cars fans, the podcast will soon celebrate its 300th episode, and we want you to be a part of that milestone. So much has changed in the automotive landscape since we first started recording the show back in 2013, nearly eight years ago. So we want to hear from you. What do you think the biggest changes in the auto industry will be in the next eight years? Text or email your videos to TalkingCars at iCloud.com and let us know your predictions for what you think we'll be talking about on Talking Cars in 2029. The best submissions will be featured on episode 300. Again, that's TalkingCars at iCloud.com for your video submissions. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. This week, we give our first impressions of the all-electric Volkswagen ID.4, share how Consumer Reports measures electric vehicle range, and how long is the life cycle of your car's touchscreen, next on Talking Cars. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'm John Lincove. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Gabe Shenhar. And, you know, this week, we're going to kind of blend our news and car at the track segment because we've gotten a ton of questions about a, a new EV, uh, the Volkswagen ID.4. And we just actually happened to get one in uh, that we're renting from Volkswagen to to get a first drive, first taste of, of this new model. Um, so it just really works out well that we're able to just blend it together. For those of you who don't know what the ID.4 is, and it's ID.4 um, is how it's written out, um, it, it's... Volkswagen's first pure ground up EV has an EPA estimated 250 mile range for the first edition and the Pro S models, which are the first ones to go on sale. Uh, first models launched have an 82 kilowatt hour battery. A rear mounted motor makes 201 horsepower, 228 pound feet of torque. Um, Volkswagen claims that, and this is a quote, at a DC fast charging station with 125 kilowatt output. The ID.4 can go from 5 to 80% charged in about 38 minutes, unquote. Um, since EPA uses and allows manufacturers to use about uh, 13 cents per kilowatt hour when figuring out costs for charging, uh, Volkswagen estimates or EPA estimates that the uh, estimated cost for fueling the car is about $700 for a year. Um, owners will get three years of unlimited charging sessions at the Electrify America charging network. More on that later. Um, so Gabe, Give us some details on on this this new model and you know who it's who it's targeting. Is it a high end, low end? You know what what's up with it? Okay, first uh, let's just uh, put it in context a little bit. Uh, as you all remember, uh, Volkswagen got caught cheating in uh, uh, diesel emissions uh, five years ago, and uh, the ID four is actually uh, VW's car of atonement. Uh, so they've been talking about. Uh, um, uh, making EVs for a while, and they had a few concepts here and there. Every auto show, a concept, you know, comes and goes. Now, finally, the ID4 uh, is uh, a, a real model aimed straight at the heart of uh, the small SUV class. Uh, offers uh, a lot of versatility, a lot of uh, uh, basically an SUV-ish kind of body style, and uh, it's roomy inside. And uh, and that kind of positions it uh, you know, almost in the uh, in in the neighborhood of the Chevy Bolt and uh, the Kia Niro EV and uh, Hyundai Kona electric, um, and uh, considerably below the Model Y from Tesla and the uh, Mustang Mach E from Ford. So that uh, should really help uh, attract uh, quite a bit of mainstream buyers that are. Kind of beyond the early adapters. Uh, which which version did we get of the two? And it it's only rear wheel drive right now, right? Right. So uh, our uh, rented one is a first edition rear wheel drive, uh, two hundred and one horsepower. The one we have on order, which we'll see probably next month, is the uh, all wheel drive with about three hundred horsepower. Cool. So um, what's been Monty? I, I mean, each of us put put our time in it already. We got we got some time. Um, behind the wheel of it. Monty, give us some impressions that you had first, you know, driving it, driving it and tell us what you think about it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I actually think it looks kind of cool. Um, so that that's, I think, important to buyers. Uh, I will say, so 
you know, it's hard not to think about it compared to something like the Chevy Bolt, uh, but it feels like a more mature car than the Chevy Bolt in terms of, you know, the interior is nicer, uh, better materials, as we expect from from Volkswagen. But it doesn't have that, you know, uh, super strong acceleration off the line like a Bolt does. You know, it actually was a little bit underwhelming to me, even uh, I, I didn't, I couldn't tell if there was any difference in power between sport and comfort mode, but when you floor it, it just kind of, kind of eases off the line. I guess you could say in a way it's, it's maybe, um, th- that relaxed fashion is a little more upscale maybe, but you know, we're, we've gotten used to Tesla's and, uh, the, the Ford Mustang Mach-E that just, you know, take off pretty quickly and, you know, Audi e-tron. But, um, so, so that part was a little underwhelming, but w- in terms of like the handling, uh, took it around our road course a little bit. And um, I was actually kind of impressed with how well it did. It's got that nice um, responsive nature. You know, when you let back off the throttle, say midway through a turn, because you're starting to push a little wide, uh, especially it seemed like if you're in the B, you know, kind of regeneration mode, uh, it, you let off the throttle and it really uh, tucks the front back in and slides the tail out a little bit. So that, that aspect's um, pretty fun. And... Um, but I thought the ride was um, okay, but a little, you know, a little stiffer in some some areas over some of our bumps on our rec road and some of our uh, sort of pothole or or manhole grates than I was expecting. But overall, uh, as far as the driving, I thought it was pretty good. It, it just I was a little surprised. I'm curious what Gabe and you guys thought about the acceleration. It just you're used to EVs giving you everything at once, and kind of that's part of the thrill of an EV is you get a lot of acceleration right off the line. I didn't I didn't see that with this thing. Yeah, Gabe, you know one of the questions since you. You live a little, you know, further from the test track than Monty and I do. Um, you put it, put a lot of miles on it, especially the weekend. So, what was it like trying to charge it up on Electrify American Network, um, and and just driving it on the highway, driving it, you know, that distance? So, yeah, I agree with uh, Monty that the acceleration is not overwhelming. Although there is a difference between uh, sport mode and comfort mode. In sport mode, the throttle uh, is a little more responsive, and uh, it also firms up the steering a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have to wait and, and see, uh, what happens with the more powerful version that we're going to get. Um, now I, uh, yeah, I, I drove the car, uh, for the whole weekend. And, uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, apart from those that are really in the know who spotted it, uh, I got no looks, uh, nothing compared to the, to the Mustang Mach-E, which was, uh, such a, such a conversation, uh, starter. Uh, so yeah now uh, as far as charging it uh, i didn't go to electrify america because uh it's it's just uh, the, the closest uh, venue of electrify america has uh it's kind of in the middle of nowhere there's nothing to do there so uh but uh there is regular level 2 charging that's uh, less than a mile uh, walk from my house so i can charge there and uh and just to hedge against uh, coming back uh, to the track uh and just for the experience i plugged it in um, I was going to take a walk with my wife anyway, so why not? And uh, got uh, about 60 miles worth of range uh, over a two and a half hour of, of, of charging. So that's uh, not too bad. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was it, you know, space-wise, what are your feelings on that? And, and also the controls. I mean, the controls are a big thing. They're, they're very unique. Um, it's a little little Tesla, a little not Tesla as far as, you know, screens and size and such like that. But um you know, definitely something different than what we've seen from Volkswagen up to this point. And their controls, their infotainment systems and such have been you know, pretty well received. We've, we've liked them. Yeah, everybody is trying to uh, imitate Tesla with, uh, first of all, no uh, start button. So you wake up the car when your foot hits the brake pedal and uh, then everything is, uh, almost everything is in the screen. Uh, but uh, it's it's uh, quick to respond. It uh, as, as soon as... I mean, at first, there's definitely a learning curve. At first, I didn't know who was on first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, luckily, the car was smart enough to know that uh, uh, to play classic vinyl because, uh, you know, <laughs> it knew that I like that. Yeah. Anyway, so after about 20 minutes, I realized there's this uh, blue square on the screen. Right. And that uh, just is the gateway to all the categories and everything. So uh, so I uh, kind of got, got the hang of it uh, pretty quickly. Um so that, uh, I mean, there are a few annoyances there, like the uh, window switches, uh, because you have to choose if you want the rear ones or the front ones. Uh, somehow, VW ran out of uh, window <laughs> controls. 
<laughs> There's no other way to explain it. It's a- and uh, another quirk is that uh, when, when I was ready to unplug the car, uh, the coupler didn't want to come out. And, um, you know, and I'm in the dark and I'm stepping on snow and it's um, really not happy. And um, so then I, I went back uh, to the screen. I saw something that looks like stop charging. So I hit stop charging and then I heard click and uh, which meant the, the coupler was uh, ready to be released. I think it's important that we acknowledge that as an owner, you will get used to some of these things. That said, I didn't find that, you know, little uh, blue chiclet like um, square that's, that's the home screen uh, till the videographer told me about it because he'd already been in the car for a while. And there's it, just even the gear selector, the way, you know, it's it's this lever sort of thing up on the side of the instrument cluster. And that's just not intuitive the way you you turn it back and forth. I mean, I did a lot of turning around and backing up and... Uh, I always had to really look and make sure that I'd gone in, did, hold it, did I go into reverse or did I go in, you know, when I went into drive, did I go into drive or did I go into the B, you know, regeneration mode? So that's a little unintuitive. Um, the other thing, like Gabe said, the, the rear window thing, it'd be fine if if they have that, but even this little, it's not even really a button, it's just an area on the you know, armrest that you press or the controls that you press, sometimes it didn't work. So I press it and it wouldn't light up. So you have to press it until it lights up. And that's just weird. And then um, when you're, you know, if you want to do the climate controls, you have to hit a climate button to bring up the controls on the screen. The one thing you can see at all times are the seat heaters. But even then, you press the seat heater icon on the screen, which then brings up the climate screen. So then you still have to hit another button to still adjust the controls or adjust the seat heaters when it seems like, okay, you've got the thing right there. Why can't you just press it and it goes to like three and then you hit it again, it goes to two, it goes to, so there's just too many things um, that that uh, don't make sense to me. And then even the, the climate like temperatures. So it's this sort of capacitive touch or whatever you want to call these things. You don't hit the where it's blue or red, blue for cold or red for hotter. You actually hit behind them yet they put the volume controls, which are over to the right, uh, you know, in the center of the screen, You, they put them in the spot where you actually press. So it's just uh, just a lot of things that just don't make sense. Not to mention the fact, I think Gabe might agree, the dash vents, the center dash vents are pretty low. And, and you know, usually like them up higher so you can get them up onto your face. I was trying to always adjust them up toward me. So there's just some things that just, again, some of these things you'll get used to, but some of these things are just really kind of silly. Yeah, I, I I agree on on some of it. The you know you can you can slide um with the volume control like you're uh, you know a little bit as well and you could tap um you know it does take a little bit of getting used to i think the the weirdest thing is like we talked about the windows and you know are we harping on it it's one of those things you inadvertently touch so if it's activated for the front window and you brush your hand there to go lift the switch then you activate the rear and that's what was weird because yes it's the first time driving it again you maybe the dealer will explain it maybe you read the manual totally get it but you, you're going to brush it inadvertently and lower the rear window at a time when you when you don't want to. You know, right. it's raining or something, and you want the front window open. Um, I, I like driving it. I found it really pretty pretty composed over rough roads. I drove it on a lot of the secondary roads in our area, which after a winter are are pretty bad. Um, you know, a lot of ruts and and broken pavement. You know, so the interesting thing is, you know, would I take this on a on a far trip? I mean, I took our Tesla Model Y for a long trip to Long Island. Uh, you know, you just press on a screen supercharger, it brings, it tells you where to go. I got on the Merritt Parkway. I got to the end of the Merritt Parkway in New York. I charged the the Model Y for, I, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes at the most and got a huge amount of, of range. You know, Electrify America, is it behind a, you know, are those chargers behind a fence in a mall that was open in 2019, but now with COVID, it's closed? You know, it leads us into a question, Mike, why does Electrify America exist? Gabe touched on it earlier, but right. you know, tell us a little bit more about it and why it's there, why it's part, you know, part of Volkswagen. Right. So basically, it's a, it's a, a spinoff company for Volkswagen uh, that they they basically to atone for their sins of the of the Dieselgate you know emissions scandal that happened years ago in 2016. They they formed uh, Electrify America. And they were basically part of their agreement to atone for what they had done was to spend two billion dollars on, you know, uh, manufacturing, promoting, building infrastructure for electric vehicles, you know, building hundreds of, of charging stations uh, across the country. 
Um, and so it's it's a ten year plan that they're you know in in the middle of right now to to do that. And you know it's funny they were required to do it because they had done something wrong. But in the end, it's it's probably going to work out well for them because it does appear that, you know, electric vehicles are the way that, you know, the industry seems to be going. So in the end, it's it, it might out actually, I guess, work out pretty well for them, other than that they still, I think, will. I don't know how long their, their name's going to be tarnished because of what they did. Yeah, totally not altruistic but in any way. Um, re- maybe you could say or benefiting as best from a bad situation. If you want to read about Dieselgate, we have a lot on consumerreports.org um, about the background of that. Uh, you know, wrapping up, you know, we I, I started the segment talking about all the interests and we actually got a really interesting question uh, just this week. So right before we started, uh, you know, doing this, doing the video, um, Ozzy from Los Angeles asks us, I've been keeping an eye on the Volkswagen ID4 release, but how do online reservations usually work? Will the car be the exact price at which I reserve it or will there be a chance to negotiate the price like you would at a dealership? So, you know, Gabe, we, we buy a lot of vehicles this way, particularly the new EVs. We even have more on order. What, what can Ozzy expect when he, if and when he puts his, uh, puts his name on a car and, and, you know, puts down a deposit? If it's such a highly anticipated car that has a lot of hype and uh, a lot of uh, pent up demand, then uh, when you order online, basically the transaction is between you and the manufacturer. And... The price is the MSRP or sticker price. And at that point, the dealer uh, only becomes a venue for the delivery. And uh, so uh, there is no, uh, there isn't a whole lot of uh, opportunity to negotiate as if you're buying a car that's already in, de- in dealer stock. Um, uh, that said, uh, if you had a car that's uh, highly uh, anticipated and, and popular that arrives at a dealer and it's the first one uh, that the dealer sees in, in your whole state, then you're unlikely to get any discounts on that car either. So uh, would he be uh, potentially getting uh, one of those, uh, you know, market adjustments uh, slapped on, you know, like like you see maybe with, a you know, Mustang GT500, for example, you know, you get a, you know, five, 10 grand adjustment, you know, for the dealer to make money on it. Um, or is it that, you know, he's got a, he's got a contract basically, and he's going to pay the sticker, um, no discount, but no, no on top of it upcharge, right? Right. No, no discount and uh, no extra charging because I mean, that, that uh, practice is really, I mean, it shouldn't happen, but it does because dealers are independent uh, business people and uh, not uh, the, 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 MSRP is a suggested price, so they don't have to legally abide by that price necessarily. So we we, right. we saw that with the suit with the Toyota Super, right? When we were looking around to buy ours, uh, I, I think it was Ryan Pizlikowski was the one buying it, and it took him a while to find one that wasn't marked over uh, over the you know the the suggested retail price, you know the total cost. But he ended up find, was able to find ones. But in a way, locking it in, I guess could be a good thing for, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, you don't, you, you pretty much, it looks like have no chance of getting a reduced price or negotiating with the dealer, but at least you're not going to pay 10 grand or five grand over the, over the price, right? Right. Well, you know what, we're going to have a ton more on this. We'll have a first drive on consumerreports.org. We're going to be getting ours in, like Gabe said. So we're going to be getting our all wheel drive one in hopefully uh, soon. We'll have more information on that and uh, we'll have our ratings up as soon as we can get it tested, get miles on it and tested. So before we move on, we just want to take a moment to let you know about the Talking Cars donation program. If you're not aware, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit, so all the work we do is funded by memberships as well as donations. If you're able to give, it really does help us keep doing the work that we do, including this show. You could find more info at cr.org slash givetalkingcars. So now we'll move on to the questions part of the show. And as always, please keep them coming. Talkingcars at iCloud.com. Text questions, video questions are great. Uh, Keep them coming, please. Our first question comes from Thomas, who says, I'm in the market for a minivan as my family grows, and I'm considering the new 2022 Kia Carnival that's due to be released this year. According to CR's data, reliability looks good for the current generation Sedona minivan, which is what the Carnival replaces. Do you anticipate Kia maintaining the reliability for the Carnival? Monty, what do you uh, 
What do you have for us on uh, on the brand new minivan coming out from uh, Kia? Well, first of all, I think it's pronounced Carnival, isn't it? Carnival. I don't. Okay. I have no. I have no idea how it's pronounced. Um, <laughs> that's that's a name that they've used in other markets for a long time. So, uh, but yes. So the current Kia Sedona is is an average is average predicted reliability uh, according to our data, and the 2022 Carnival is also predicted to be average reliability. So good, but but not great. Um, or not necessarily great. What I would also say, though, is just remember that we typically recommend against, you know, not buying a first, you know, the first year of, uh, you know, all new or redesigned models, such as the in, in this case with a carnival. And or if you if you feel like you have to buy it that first year, at least don't be don't take one of the first ones off, you know, that arrives at the dealer lot. Wait, you know, after it goes on sale, maybe wait at least six months because we've, you know, you we see a fair amount of whether it's technical service bulletins or, you know, even recalls. And it's not that the car is necessarily unsafe, but why go through that hassle of that you're going to have to bring the car back to the dealer because they realize that there are a few things they could have gotten a little bit better or maybe that, that they need to fix. So would suggest... Yes, it looks like it, it should be reasonably reliable, but don't be one of the first ones to to uh, buy it off the dealer lot. But definitely. I mean, you know, we, we've seen recalls as much as they narrow it down to a certain batch of cars because one day a torque setting might have been, you know, improper on a on a impact wrench or, you know, something like that, like where there's just things that happen. Right. Um, especially with, especially early on in the in the particularly with first year models. Yeah, yeah. it's still going through teething, growing right. pain. So yeah. give it, excellent. Give them a chance to learn how to build it. <laughs> yes, it's true. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, everything, you know, everything, everything takes a little bit of time. They, yeah. they built it. They designed it. It's a complicated process. But then, you know, assembling it and, and seeing how it out in the real world, uh, you know, that, that's it's, another thing. It's, so, it's Thomas. It's hard to be perfect. Saying, it's, it's hard to be perfect. It really is. So Thomas, you know. Let us know next year when you buy the uh, the Carnival, uh, you know, the 2023, maybe, um, you know, let us know what you think about it. Uh, our second question comes from Chris, who says, I'm interested in your reaction to Tesla's comments regarding the screen longevity in their cars. Basically, they said that the screens have a finite life, much shorter than the other components, and that owners should expect to replace it just as they do for brake pads, tires, etc. Despite that, the government is still requiring a recall. As all cars become more electronic... How much of a problem will electronic component wear become an issue? Gabe, give us some uh, give us some information on the screens screen life with Tesla and and even you know the recall that uh, that Chris references. You know everything has a finite lifetime, even a transmission that lasts for twenty years and for two hundred thousand miles. So, uh, but there's a difference here. Uh, I mean, people uh, expect uh, certain things to kind of uh, be disposable items like tires and batteries and wipers and whatnot. Um, and you get advanced warning for that. But uh, when the screen goes out uh, without any advanced warning and you lose your ability to access the infotainment system and even the, the defroster and all of a sudden you can't see or uh, and you lose your uh, rear camera, that, that can potentially have safety implications. Uh, so uh, uh, Tesla doesn't agree with uh, NHTSA that, uh, or National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that there is a safety problem here or a potential for one. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Tesla's proceeding with the recall and uh, it's, um, it, in my mind, it's more of a reliability problem. And we see it in our survey, in our member survey that Model S and Model X uh, have multiple problems with, uh, with the screen. And uh, in later models, and the Model 3 and the Model Y, it's, uh, it's much better. Yeah, and it's not the same as a software update. I mean, other, you know, you, you will expect software updates for systems to keep them going, you know, for Audi's MMI or Command and Mercedes Benz or something like that. This is actually a, a component that just prevents it from working, right? Right. And uh, yeah, Tesla is not the only manufacturer that uh, uses touch screens, uh, but uh, we don't see the same frequency of problems uh, in, in, with other manufacturers. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Kevin from Cincinnati who says, I have a long daily commute, 120 miles, and I've seen various publications comparing their real-world EV range data against the EPA estimates. Some seem to agree with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, while other results vary significantly. CR does its own MPG testing, and I was wondering if there are plans to develop its own EV mileage tests. Okay, we're going to go back to you as, as Mr. EV, and that's your new name. Thank you. Uh, we've uh, <laughs> guilty as charged. 
<laughs> We've been testing uh, EVs for 10 years by now. And up until 2017, we used to do our own uh, range test. And uh, and then we kind of uh, paused and reevaluated and compared our findings to the EPA findings. And uh, we concluded that uh, uh, for all the EVs uh, we had tested up to that point, uh, our difference with the EPA amounts to single digit percentage wise. Uh, EV range is not an exact science. It uh, very much dependent on uh, the terrain, the speed, the temperature. In addition, manufacturers have the ability to increase uh, battery range uh, uh, through over-the-air updates, and that uh, just makes your testing uh, obsolete. Excellent. Uh, our final question comes from Lamar from Chicago. He says, I have a 2011 Toyota Camry with $15,000 left to pay it off from a private dealer. However, I really want to trade it in to lease a 2021 Toyota Venza with the hope to just pay the equity each month on my lease. Would that hurt my lease deal? Give me some ideas, please. Uh, I, I, Keith Barry and I, our, our other panelist host, um, and I batted this about because it, it seems like it's, it's a not really a great situation financially at this point. Uh, given the value of a 2011 Toyota Camry, which you know, depending on where you are and the condition of the vehicle and the mileage, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, isn't part of the question, you know, it could be that you're owing like 11, you have an $11,000 upside down, you know, where you owe $11,000 more on the car than it's worth. Um, you know, at the best, you maybe owe about three to $4,000 on the car than, than what it's worth. You know, if, if it's probably not going to be in your, uh, your best interest to try to roll that into a lease deal, you're going to be taking Whatever that that val- that extra money is less, you know, that you owe less the value of the car, you know, plowing that into a lease, which is going to be, you know, you're you're leasing a segment of the vehicle, but you're leasing the most expensive part of the vehicle, the the first few years of it. So um, you're going to have this huge payment, um, you know, because of the negative equity. Uh, it, it's probably the best the best advice at this point for you, Lamar, is to continue to plow as much money as you can into that Camry, uh, you know. Get the try to get close to owing, you know, what it's worth at least, um, you know, or pay it off if you can, so that you then have an asset that you could you could trade in, um, you know, or sell in the private market. You can definitely take the car to CarMax. Um, you could take it to a Toyota dealer, and, and you'll get a value. You know, say, you know, I, I want to trade it in. Um, you know, it may be it's going to be hard because of a lien on the car, but you could at least get an idea of the value of the vehicle. Um, it, you know, it may be also hard if it's a buy here, pay here type of dealer as private versus you know just a regular used car sales lot that you know you're financing through an uh, you know a different party. Also, check your credit score. Your credit score is going to have uh, an impact on the the type of lease deal that you're going to get on a Venza. Um, you know, and, and also just how much money do you have aside? You know, if, if you really are still going this way, you know, do you have enough that you could put a big down payment on the Venza so that you're going to lower that amount, you know, and then at least roll some of the negative equity at the end, it's the, the advice pretty much is hold on to that car, pay it off as much as quickly as possible. Um, you know, it may be a challenge, but you know, you're just going to run into a huge cycle of debt. If you're going to plow all that money back into the Venza, you're just going to have a huge payment each month. It's so. it's tough because you can see that it, it'd be nice to have a brand new car. Totally, totally understand that. But 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 it financially, totally. it's, it sounds like it doesn't make a lot of sense right now. It, it does. You know, you know, you're right, Monty. I mean, you know, for, for the, the comfort, for the miles, you know, we don't know how many miles are on it. For the safety features, you know, for the fuel economy. I mean, maybe, you know, he's going to be driving, uh, you know, in the city a lot, you know, take advantage of the hybrid. Um it, it's just an unfortunate situation, you know, with, with the finances, and it's one to, you know, keep an eye on, uh, you know, going forward. So that does it for this week's episode. As always, remember to send us your questions and your videos to talkingcars at iCloud.com. Check the show notes below for more on what we talked about in this episode. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.